Uh, I wanted to thank Dr. Curtin and Dr. Blank for the invitation, as well as the foundation. It's my first survivor's course. I'm, uh, I think this is fabulous, this amount of turnout. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. And I appreciate the topic that I was asked to address, um, to speak about the meaning of CA-125, because I spend a lot of time in my office explaining to patients what the significance of this test is. And uh, this gives me an opportunity to speak to a lot of patients uh, at the same time, or survivors, so I'm happy for that opportunity. Um, today I wanted to first really tell the story of how the test was developed, because I think once you understand how this test came about, you'll understand some of its uh, uses and limitations. Um, we can talk about what the potential uses are, and then really get down to what it's been proven to be able to do. Um, I want to start the story on the development of, of uh, the test with this man. This is Dr. Robert Knapp. And I'm going to start the story off with Dr. Knapp uh, for a few reasons. Most importantly, he's the, it, it was discovered in his lab at Harvard. So he's a co-inventor of CA-125. Um, but after, become, after serving as the director of gynecologic oncology up at Harvard um, at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, he eventually retired and, and moved back down to Manhattan and is a visiting scholar at Wild Cornell Medical Center where I was introduced to him about seven years ago. And I have to say he's been about probably the most influential mentor for my career. So um, I've spent a lot of time talking to him, so I've heard this story about the development of this test over and over. So I can tell you what it's like to be a paratrooper in World War II, and I can tell you how CA-125 was developed <laughs> because of Dr. Knapp. So I'm going to start the story off in 1970 with Dr. Knapp going up to Harvard. Um, and he was actually interested in immunotherapy. Uh, Dr. Parturi mentioned about these trials of how the immune system might be able to kill cancer, but Dr. Knapp, with very little proof that it could be done, really believed that the body should be able to see this as foreign and mount an immune response, but maybe it needed some help. And uh, he, what, what he was working on up at Harvard was a mouse model of ovarian cancer, which a mouse he had gotten from this laboratory. It's called the uh, C3HEB mouse. I think it was a C3HEB FEJ mouse, to be exact. And he speaks of this rodent with, with great fondness. And he says that this mouse actually got him tenure at Harvard <laughs> because he developed this uh, mouse model where he was able to inject it with ovarian cancer cells and uh, be able to study a lot of different aspects of why, why people develop ascites, um, but also to test immune therapies. And, um, that he had variable results with some of his immune um, uh, studies going on, and I think he really needed a critical mass of people there with him, and he started putting that mass together. This is uh, the next man I would like to bring up. Um, this is Bob Bast, and, and some of you may know Dr. Bast. He's a huge name in the field of oncology. He's currently the chair for cancer research at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. But back in the 70s, he was completing his fellowship in medical oncology at Harvard at the uh, Sidney Farber Cancer Center. And he was also interested in immune therapy for cancers. He had been at the NIH for some years working but in leukemia. So he really didn't have any ovarian cancer background. But on graduation, he joins the lab of Dr. Knapp. And they begin working together on the C3HEB mouse model to develop immune therapy. They were having trouble with their immune therapy because they couldn't develop a magic bullet. The idea was if you could find an antigen on the cancer cell that you could uh, maybe put a radioactive substance or a chemotherapy and get it to go just to the cancer that it would work. But at the time, all the antibodies that they had, they, they would react with a number of different things. They didn't know how to get what's called a monoclonal antibody, that silver bullet that will look for one thing. And the next two men I'd like to bring up in this story are the German cell biologist George Kohler and the Argentinian biochemist Cesar Milstein because they were in Cambridge at this time developing a technology called uh, a hybridoma to produce monoclonal antibodies, that silver bullet that they were looking for. Um, what they would do is take a B lymphocyte. These are the cells in your body that normally produce immunoglobulins or, or antibodies, sorry. And it was a specific antibody against one uh, antigen. And they would fuse it with a cancer cell. It was called the myeloma cell. It's a bone marrow cancer. And so you could produce a system where you could make monoclonal antibodies in perpetuity. It, it would just never die because it was a cancer cell. And these guys won a Nobel Prize for their work uh, on this. But both Dr. Bast and Dr. Knapp went to Cambridge. And they studied with Milstein and learned this, uh, this technique of making monoclonal antibodies 
hoping to be able to cure this mouse with a, a magic bullet. The next person I'd like to mention in the story is, is the one that I don't think anybody really knew of. I only learned over, of her over dinner. This is Miss McDonald. Um, I only know Miss McDonald because Dr. Knapp told me that he was uh, trying to make a hybridoma using cancer cells from the uh, surgeries he was doing. Dr. Bass was in the lab. He was still operating. And they would bring tumor into the lab, make a hybridoma, and hope to make antibodies that were specific against ovarian cancer but all of them were reacting with cancer cells as well as normal ovaries, so they weren't working out well. And they had tried this 124 times with no success. The 125th attempt was cells from Miss McDonald. Uh, it came from ascites that had been drained. And it was that hybridoma that produced uh, a monoclonal antibody that was specific for ovarian cancer. And so I always wondered why it was called CA125, but it was the 125th attempt that worked. So most people don't know who Miss McDonald is, um, and I, it reminded me of the story of Henrietta Lacks. I don't know if you all know this book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, but this was a, a poor black woman in the South who had cervix cancer, whose cells were immortalized, and leading to a very, very strong cancer cell line called HeLa cells. And uh, you know, this book made her famous after her death, obviously, but after learning of Miss McDonald, I, I realized Henrietta Lacks is not alone. There are probably untold uh, patients whose whose cells have been used to help people around the world. Um, once they got this monoclonal antibody, they, they didn't know really what to do with it. The first study just showed that it was specific to ovarian cancers. When they used this monoclonal antibody, they found that it reacted with all six of the ovarian cancer cell lines that had been established. 12 out of 20 of the cancers that they brought into the lab from patients, it went straight to the cancer cells. And it seemed to be somewhat specific for ovarian cancer. When you had non-ovarian cancers, it only reacted with one out of 14 of non-ovarian cancers. So they knew they had something important with this monoclonal antibody. And they set about trying to treat this mouse model with this magic bullet using this monoclonal antibody and attaching it to radioactive iodine. And uh, it actually worked in the mice, but unfortunately, it never panned out in humans. They did a number of trials showing that uh, it had acceptable toxicity, but it never changed overall survival. But other people had found out about this monoclonal antibody as well, and they were very interested in developing this in, in a number of different ways. Um, they eventually worked with uh, Dr. Zarowski, who was working for a company called Centacor, and they wanted to use the technology to develop a blood test that could measure the amount of CA125, the antigen, in someone's blood. And they used a technique called radioimmunoassay. To do a radioimmunoassay, um, you have to have a monoclonal antibody for the agent that you look for, the antigen you're looking for. It's tagged to uh, these uh, radioactive antigens. And then when you add the patient's blood, the amount of CA125 she has circulating in her blood will displace some of the uh, radioactive antigens, and then you can measure how much got displaced, and it will tell you how much was in her, in her blood to start off with. So there was a way now to measure the level of this circulating CA125 using this monoclonal antibody. Now, the interesting thing is every s test that's done worldwide is still using the monoclonal antibody from Ms. McDonald. So, once they had the blood test, they started doing studies on what could you do with this blood test. And they diversified out. They, uh, Dr. Knapp really shared uh, the monoclonal antibody and the radioimmunoassay with uh, Dr. Rodrigue Mortel at Penn State and uh, Jonathan Berrick at UCLA and a, num a number of big names in G1 oncology. Uh, I guess they, they didn't have conference calls and uh, things like this, so they would all fly into O'Hare and they would meet in the airport and just meet for a little while and then fly home. But they started doing a number of studies. Uh, one of the first that was done was just seeing what's the level of CA125 in healthy women who don't have ovarian cancer. And they had a serum, a serum bank of healthy women. They tested 888 of them. And they found that if you looked at healthy women and you use a cutoff of 35 international units, only one out of the 888 healthy women had a CA125 above that number. But when you looked at women who had ovarian cancer, 82% of them had a CA125 above 35, and that's how that cutoff was established for the initial test of 35. More importantly, what he so showed was, because he had serum samples banked on patients during their treatment, 
he could see that as the CA125 went up, those patients were usually progressing and the chemotherapy wasn't working. And when it was going down, the patients were actually doing better. So that really became uh, one of the most important findings of the first study, that you could monitor how somebody's doing to chem with chemotherapy during initial treatment. But you can see all the potential uses that this thing could be used for. I mean, you, maybe you could screen asymptomatic women and pick up early cancers and lead to an improvement in survival. Uh, maybe you can use this in the surveillance of women who had ovarian cancer, but now in remission and pick up earlier recurrences and improve survival. And then there was always the difficulty in determining who has cancer when somebody walks in your office with a pelvic mass. Um, maybe this test could help distinguish what was cancer so she could go to an oncologist and what's benign so she could stick with her general gynecologist. I could spend an hour on each one of those topics, how much, there's been over a thousand publications in the literature on CA125, but I'm going to distill it down to just a few important studies. As far as using CA125 to monitor the initial response, Dr. Knapp's initial finding that it was 93% sensitive in monitoring response has been proven repeatedly, so much so that CA125 is used just as much as CT scan findings in determining response and progression um, in clinical trials. So the GCIG, the Gynecologic Cancer Intergroup Study uh, Group, has decided that this uh, definition should be used in all clinical trials of ovarian cancer for first uh, line response. Patients are responding if they have at least a 50% reduction in their CA125 levels from pretreatment sample. And they're progressing if it's at least doubling the CA125 from either the upper limit of normal from the lab or if it's doubled from the lowest level that that patient ever had gotten to, what's called the Nader value. And, it's, and the studies have shown that if, if the CA125 doubles like this, the tumor is progressing 98% of the time. There's only a 2% chance that it's, it's, it's doubling like this for some other reason. So monitoring response to, the, uh, to chemotherapy is actually the only FDA-approved indication for CA125, even after all these years. When it comes to screening, I think Dr. Hoskins already addressed this very well, uh, CA125 unfortunately has not proven to be an effective screen for ovarian cancer for a number of the reasons that Dr. Hoskins mentioned. One, it's got low sensitivity. So while it's elevated in Dr. Knapp's initial study in 82% of patients, most of those patients had stage three and four disease. Obviously, if you're looking for a screen, you need something that'll pick up stage one disease. And there it's only elevated 50% of the time. But it's also a little dangerous, especially in premenopausal women, because it's not specific for ovarian cancer and can be elevated by a number of these benign gynecologic problems, some of them that are very common in healthy women, like fibroids, endometriosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, as well as a number of non-gynecologic pathologies can elevate your CA125. So there have been a lot of studies on ovarian cancer screening, but probably I think the, at least using it as a straight cutoff, the nail in the coffin was really the PLCO trial. The PLCO trial was a, a trial funded by the National Cancer Institute, and it was launched to address the effectiveness of screening for those four cancers, prostate, lung, colon, and ovarian. And it had 78,000 women enrolled, um, about half and half to be screened and not screened. The screening intervention consisted of an annual transvaginal sonogram for the first four years, and serum CA125s once a year for six years. And then at the end of the study, they looked at ovarian cancer mortality between those who were screened and those who were not screened, and unfortunately, there was no difference between the two groups. Um, also concerning was uh, the fact that out of the women on the screening arm, the ones who went to surgery, there was about a 15% complication rate associated with the surgeries that they had done. So not only was there no proven survival benefit, but there was a, uh, a detriment with regard to uh, the unnecessary surgeries and the risks of the complications from them. Um, I would hesitate, I, I wouldn't say that CA125 has no role in screening yet because there's still a, a major trial going on and the results aren't back yet. The United Kingdom collaborative trial on ovarian cancer screening is still ongoing with results expected in 2015. The reason why I would say I hold a, hope open hope for this trial is that they're not using a straight cutoff for CA125. All the other trials use 35 or, or one single number. This trial is using an algorithm of the change in CA125 from one value to the next to try to predict who's developing 
uh, on ovarian cancer and using that as a screen. So we'll have to see how that trial works out. As far as the CA125 surveillance of women who are in remission for recurrence, um, it has been used in that way, and it's been proven effective to some degree. Um, this picture is Dr. Gordon Rustin, Director of Medical Oncology at the East and North Hertz uh, National Health Service Trust in England. Um, and he was able to show that if you have women who have no evidence of cancer after being treated and you follow their CA125, if it doubles the upper limit of normal and stays that way for at least a month, that 94% of those patients had uh, recurrence. And what was interesting about this was that, that that increase happened on average four to five months before there was ever symptoms or a CT scan finding. So you can understand the excitement about that finding because the paradigm has always been early detection leads to better outcomes. Uh, the assumption was if that's true up front, it must be true in the recurrent setting as well. And so we all started following patients with CA125 after they're in remission in the hopes of picking up uh, earlier recurrence. And maybe some of you in the room are actively following CA125. Um, what I appreciate about Dr. Rustin is that he didn't leave it at that. He went back and did another study to see, did it really improve survival? And uh, he doesn't call this study a study of CA125 in, in surveillance. He calls it a study of early versus delayed treatment for recurrence. Because that's really what it is. If you have a test that can tell you somebody's recurred five months earlier and you institute treatment at that time, does it make a difference in overall outcome? So this was a fairly large study, 529 women randomly assigned to either be on the early intervention arm or the delayed. They're all getting CA125 drawn every three months uh, for the first two years, but the results are blinded to their doctors. The women who were assigned to be on the early intervention group, if their CA125 doubled from the upper limit of normal and stayed that way, they would get a phone call from the study center to their doctor saying this patient has recurred and they had to start treatment for that recurrence within a month. The women who were on the delayed arm, they remained blinded to the results, even if it had doubled, until they had clinical evidence of progression and they were treated at that time. Um, and what you can see here is it doesn't take a statistician to tell you that there was no difference in overall survival between the women on the early group and the women on the delayed group. Now the CA125 did what Dr. Rustin said it could do, if you look at uh, how fast somebody got treated from the time they were diagnosed with a recurrence, the women on the early group were treated about five months earlier on average than the women on the delayed group, so they got the early intervention. But if you look at how long did it take them to take a third chemotherapy, so they get treated for their recurrence, how long before another drug is used, it actually happened faster for the early intervention group than for the delayed intervention group. And if you look at the quality of the life of those patients, when did they first see a deterioration in their quality of life? It happened faster for the early intervention group than the delayed intervention group. So taken together, his study showed that, yes, CA125 can pick up recurrences faster, but he was unable to show that it made a difference in survival, and it did decrease the quality of life for the uh, patients on the early intervention group. I don't know if that means there's not a role for CA125 intervention. I think it, it, for surveillance, I think it does mean you have to discuss these findings with patients, and I do. Um, I, I personally uh, feel that there's still a role because patients who are picked up with, uh, with CA125, I find they tend to have more isolated recurrences, and we are employing more surgical debulking in the recurrent setting, and some of these cases can be done in minimally invasive ways at same-day surgeries in some cases as compared to patients who recur later where you're, if you're going to treat surgically, it's a much bigger surgery. I don't know if that changes survival, but I think that has an impact on the quality of a patient's life. What about preoperative evaluate, evaluation of women who come in with a pelvic mass? Um, one of those uh, doctors that Dr. Knapp had in the group of study, uh, the study group was Dr. Malkasian, and this study from 1988 shows early on some of the problems with using CA125 to uh, distinguish whether a pelvic mass is cancer or not. Um, they used a cutoff of 65 uh, for this study. And they showed that CA125 was pretty sensitive for the detection of epithelial ovarian cancer overall. But the positive predictive value, the chances that if this test says you have a problem that you really have ovarian cancer, 
was big, it was high in postmenopausal women, but it was low in premenopausal women. Um, and that's because the prevalence of cancer is much lower in premenopausal women. So you see early on that CA125 is limited in pelvic mass uh, detection, uh, at least determination, because of this uh, low specificity. And that's, again, because so many benign conditions can elevate your CA125. And many of these are more common in premenopausal women. But there are two newly uh, approved, uh, FDA approved tests that are helping doctors in this situation when a woman has a pelvic mass and they both contain CA125 in that test. One is called OVA1. It's, uh, it's approved for women over 18 years of age who the doctor's already decided she needs surgery for this mass. It's only to help figure out who should be doing the surgery. There's enough data showing that women who are handled by G1 oncologists from the beginning do better so it's really important to make sure they get in the right hands early. And this test has been shown to be able to do that. In its uh, FDA approval study, it had 93% sensitivity. The sensitivity is still low. I'm sorry, the specificity is still low, 43%. Um, but it did improve doctors' ability to determine whether a mass was cancer or not based on just their own opinion. The second test is using a novel tumor marker called human epididymis 4. This test is called ROMA, or the Risk of Malignancy Algorithm, and it takes into account the CA125 level, the HE4 level, and her menopausal status, and it just gives you a risk prediction, high risk, low risk, to help you, again, figure out who should be doing the surgery, a general gynecologist or a GYN oncologist. And in their FDA approval studies, you see, again, really good sensitivity, a little lower in premenopausal women, and decent specificity. But again, it did better than doctors' own opinions of whether they thought it was cancer or not. So we do have some tests to help us figure who should be doing the surgeries when you have a pelvic mass. CA125 alone can't do it, but if you mix it with other markers, it performs better. So when you look at the potential uses for serum CA125, that first finding of Dr. Knapp in that study still remains to be the only indication for CA125, monitoring patients response to treatment. Um, as far as the screening of asymptomatic women for the early detection of ovarian cancer, CA125 has not been proven to do that. As far as surveillance of women with a history of ovarian cancer who are in remission, it does work to pick up earlier re uh, recurrences. It has not been shown to change overall survival because of that. Um, and in the preoperative evaluation of women with a suspicious pelvic mass, it performs better in postmenopausal women than premenopausal women, but by itself it's not very good in either situation. But mixed with other markers, it, uh, we have two products that help in that situation. So uh, Dr. Knapp, when he retired from Harvard, they, uh, our society's journal, G1 Oncology, asked him to uh, write a, a reflection in the Distinguished, uh, uh, Distinguished Professors series. And I just wanted to uh, tell you how he started off his, because uh, I, I like the way he started this paper off. He says, 33 years ago, I believed that it was possible to develop effective therapeutic regimens to cure ovarian cancer. In fact, I thought that since the cancer was far into the host, it would be possible to stimulate the body's defense against the malignancy. Now I wonder how much the body recognizes cancer as foreign. Then I was young, eager, and naive. Now I am left with the legacy of a brash endeavor. And he finishes off on the last page by stating that I'm satisfied that the continued study of ovarian cancer is secure and in capable hands. I hope that my efforts over the past 33 years will help to achieve the goal that I strove so hard to attain, a cure for ovarian cancer. This goal is not an easy one to reach. There will be much frustration and disappointment along the way, but I firmly believe that the goal is attainable and that my legacy of a brash endeavor will no longer be harsh, will no longer be brash, but will become a reality. So uh, I uh, hope I have not been a, uh, a naysayer as far as what CA125 can and can't do. But I really think it's important for us to be honest with the tests that we use and, and about their performance because if you're satisfied with things that really don't work, it stops the search for things that do. And I think we have to recognize CA125 is great for monitoring, but that is the minority of the indications for why we do the blood test in this country. A lot of the use of CA125 is off-label and it's in ways that haven't been proven to be effective. Thank you. Thank you.